Breathing in, I'm aware of my body, of my whole body. Breathing out, I release all the tension in my body. Aware of body, releasing tension in body. Breathing in, I feel alive. (coughs) Breathing out, I smile to life in me and around me. Feeling alive. Smiling to life. Breathing in, I'm aware of the new meditation hall. With an out, I smile to the new meditation hall. Breathing in, I'm aware, I enjoy my in-breath totally from the beginning to the end. Breathing out, I enjoy my out-breath from the beginning to the end. Enjoying my in-breath, enjoying my out-breath.
Good afternoon, dear Sangha. This is a, a happy moment. We are uh, in the Pháp Vân Temple, Dhamma Cloud Temple. Today is the 31st of uh, December in the year 2009. And uh, the meditation hall we are sitting in has been built by the brothers of the upper hamlet themselves. And uh, from time to time, uh, the sisters from the other hamlets, they come and work for one day. So you can see uh, the brothers and the sisters in the four hamlets uh, when you look at the meditation hall. We just had the heating system six days ago. In, during the Christmas uh, celebration, we uh, discussed about um, the five uh, mantras. You already know the, fourth, the first four mantras. And the fifth mantra is, uh, this moment is uh, a happy moment. Uh, when we bring our mind back to the body, body and establish ourselves in the present moment, we realize that uh, we have so many conditions to be happy in the here and the now. We don't wait, we don't need to go somewhere else in order to be happy. We don't need to go to the future in order to seek for some uh, conditions of happiness. So when home to the present moment, we encounter, we recognize many conditions of happiness that are available and that make happiness uh, possible right away. And when we get that insight, we pronounce the mantra, this moment is a happy moment. And we are nourished by that happiness, and the people around us, when they hear the mantra, they feel the same, and they get the nourishment also. We are, we determine, we are determined to practice uh, this fifth mantra a lot and next year, beginning tomorrow. We have already practiced it a lot during this year. During Christmas, we also uh, discuss about uh, the four bodies. Every one of us has at least three bodies beside our physical body. We have the Buddha body, um, Buddha Kaya. There is a Buddha body in us. It's very important to recognize a Buddha in us. A Buddha is someone that is, um, that is capable of understanding and loving. And we know that we have the seed of understanding in us. We have the seed of uh, love in us. So we know that we have uh, the capacity of uh, understanding and love. And that is the presence of the Buddha in us. But that Buddha in us may, be, may not be strong enough. The body of the Buddha in us may not be strong enough. So we should allow our Buddha body to grow. We should take care of our Buddha body. As the Buddha in us grows, we become happier, freer, because our understanding and love are growing with the Buddha body. So the Buddha body in us is not an abstract idea. It is something very real, very concrete, because all of us 
have the capacity to understand and to love. And we, we believe that. We know that uh, there were time in the past we was able to understand, to forgive, to love. And there's no uh, reason not to believe in the Buddha body in us. And in order, in order to nourish the uh, Buddha body in us, we have to, uh, to practice. The practice of mindfulness, concentration, and insight is called the practice of the Dharma. When we sit, we sit mindfully, so that we can enjoy more our city. When we walk, we walk mindfully, so that we can enjoy every step. When we eat, we eat mindfully with concentration, so that we can enjoy every morsel of food that we eat. Every moment of our daily life can be joyful and happy, thanks to the practice of mindfulness. When we wash our dishes, and if we know how to wash the dishes mindfully, we enjoy dishwashing. We can smile, we can practice mindful breathing while uh, doing the dishes. So that moment is also a moment of practice. And when we practice um, breathing, walking mindfully, eating mindfully, dishwashing mindfully, the Buddha body in us grows. And we know that uh, the practice of mindfulness, the practice of the Dharma, help the Buddha body to grow. We know that uh, a Buddha is someone that is made of uh, mindfulness, concentration, and insight. And these three energies are generated by the practice. So practicing mindfulness is to nourish the, the Buddha in us. And therefore, besides having a Buddha body, you also have a Dharma body. That's our second body. <coughs> you are a friend of the Buddha. You are a young brother of the Buddha, a young sister of the Buddha. You are a student of the Buddha. Uh, you have uh, a Dharma body in you. <coughs> because uh, you practice mindful breathing, you practice mindful walking, you practice mindful eating, you practice mindful dishwashing, that is why you have a Dharma body. If you don't practice, you don't have a Dharma body. But because you, you are, you have been practicing, that is why you do have a Dharma body in you. Dhammakaya. Dhammakaya. But uh, the Dharma body in you may, be, may, may not be strong enough. That those of us who have a strong practice, a solid practice, the Dharma body is good, is healthy. And when our Dharma body is solid, is good, our Buddha body grows very quickly. And that Dharma body we carry with us always. Wherever you go, to the supermarket, to the railway station, you bring the Dharma body with you. So you practice always, and you make the Buddha body in you continue to grow. So the Dharma body you have is your practice. People can steal your telephone, your computer, but they cannot steal your practice. 
you bring your practice along. And because of the practice, he is always with you. You always get the nourishment, the healing. And if you are a friend of the Buddha, a brother, a sister of the Buddha, a child of the Buddha, and then you have your practice with you to protect you, to nourish you. And you bring your practice wherever you go. And that practice helps you in difficult moments also. When you got into a difficult situation, thanks to the practice, you can get out of the situation maybe very quickly. And you don't have to be overwhelmed by fear or anger or despair because you have your practice. And that practice is your Dharma body. And, um, and when you practice um, um, well, the Dharma body grows. Your, da- your practice becomes more solid, stronger. And because of that, the Buddha body in you continues to grow quickly. So you have the Buddha body, you have the Dharma body. And the third body you have is the Sangha body. The Sangha is a group of people who come together in order to practice together. You might practice without the Sangha, but it's very difficult. With the Sangha, it's so easy to practice. Because everyone is breathing in and breathing out mindfully. Everyone is um, walking mindfully, eating mindfully, dishwashing mindfully. And that is why it's so easy for us to do the same. And when every, everyone in the Sangha practice, they generate a collective energy of mindfulness and concentration. And when you sit in the Sangha, you feel that collective energy that is supporting you and nourishing you. And that is why, if you are a true practitioner, you always have a Sangha body. You belong to a Sangha, a community. A Sangha means a community of practitioners. And looking on your left, you see members of your Sangha. Looking on your right, you see members of your Sangha. And you say, this is my body, this is my Sangha body, Sangha Kaya. Buddha Kaya, Dharma Kaya, and Sangha Kaya. Every one of us has these three bodies. In my tradition, we treasure the Sangha body. Because without the Sangha body, we can abandon our practice after a few months. If you have a Sangha, you always go back to your Sangha. And your Sangha protects you, nourishes you, supports you, so that you may maintain your Dharma's body strong. That is why all of us if we are true practitioners, we need a Sangha body. And if at home we don't have a Sangha, we have to try our best to set up a Sangha. Four people, five people. In the Buddhist tradition, the smallest Sangha is four people. Five is good. And more than five is excellent. Here is Sangha here in Plum Village. And 
The Sangha is not exactly outside of us, inside. She is inside. The Sangha is the kind of environment, the best kind of environment for the Buddha body and the Dharma body to grow. If you want your Buddha body and your Dharma body to continue to grow, you need to be in a Sangha. You need to practice with a Sangha. Because the Sangha provides a powerful collective energy supporting you, <laughs> guiding you, nourishing you, so that you can always uh, Mm. make uh, your Dharma body and your Buddha body grow. In, my, in our tradition, we say that uh, when a tiger left his mountain and go to the lowland, that tiger will be caught by humans and kill. When a practitioner left his or her sangha, she will lose her practice. She is no longer a practitioner. She dies as a practitioner, like a tiger without uh, a, a mountain. So that is why we, we should never leave our sangha. We should we should stay with our Sangha always. The Sangha is our mountain. In the mountain, you don't risk being caught by humans, by, by the non-practice. And that is why um, we cherish uh, the Sangha, the community. And our Sangha should be a, a true Sangha. A true Sangha is a, a Sangha where everyone practices. We really do walking meditation. And during the walking meditation, we really make uh, mindful steps. We really do sitting meditation. And during sitting meditation, we really nourish ourselves. We know how to release the tension in our body. We know how to uh, cultivate joy and happiness. We know how to handle a feeling of pain and sorrow. And when people in a Sangha practice like that, the Sangha is a real Sangha, is a true Sangha. And if the Sangha is a true Sangha, and then the, the, the Dharma is in it, and the Buddha is in it. So the safest place for you to find a Buddha is a good Sangha. Because in a good Sangha, everyone practices. So the Dharma is there, and the Buddha is there. The Dharma is also a true Dharma a real Dharma, a living Dharma. It's not the spoken Dharma or the written Dharma, but the living Dharma. When you breathe mindfully, when you sit mindfully, when you walk mindfully, you produce the living Dharma. Everyone seeing you like that is penetrated by the living Dharma. And if the living Dharma is there, sure, surely that the Buddha is there. So that is why a true Sangha carries within herself the true Dharma and the true Buddha. That is why if you devote your time to build a true Sangha, you know that this is a, a very normal thing to do, Sangha building. Sangha building is also to help build the Dharma and the Buddha. In Thailand, 
it's almost um, nine o'clock, and there will be three more hours before the new year come. The new year come to Thailand first, and to France five five uh, hours later. And uh, in Plum Village, we have the practice of um, beginning a new. so that our new year will be a much better year. There will be more peace, more happiness, more love in the new year. And today I would like to share with the members of the Sangha the practice of uh, beginning anew. A practice that can be done in three days in a row. You may use the first three days of the new year to, to make the new year really a new year. And uh, in the Buddhist tradition, the first day of uh, the year is considered to be the anniversary, the birthday of uh, the next Buddha. Uh, his name is uh, Maitreya, Metaya in Pali. And Maitreya means uh, love. He's not born yet, but we already know his name. Mr. Love. And it's very um, suitable for us to practice uh, true love. And the practice of beginning new is also the practice of true love. And this practice uh, has been recommended by Buddha himself. It's uh, simple, effective, and not difficult to practice. I have a sheet of paper here with a few lines that will be distributed to you later on. And it begins with uh, with uh, focus our attention on what uh, we really want. We, sh- we should, uh, should be aware of what we really want the most. <coughs> and the Buddha proposed like this, May I be peaceful. May I be peaceful. Happy and light in body and in mind. Happiness, how could happiness be possible if we are not peaceful? and light in our body and in our mind. If it it feels too heavy in our body, in our mind, if we don't feel peaceful, how could we be happy? So that is why, first of all, we should know what we really want. And according to the Buddha, we should tell ourselves, may I be peaceful and light in my body and my mind. Love meditation in the Buddhist tradition should be directed to yourself. You have to learn how to love yourself first before you can love someone else. And this is the practice of self-love. And I want to be peaceful. That's what I want. I want to be light in my body and in my mind. If you know what you really want, and then you can, you can give you that. There are practices that can give you that, that can give you peace, that can help your body to be light, that can help your mind to be light. May I be safe and free from accidents. There's so much violence, there's so much accidents in the world. I want to be protected. I don't want accidents. 
That's what I want. I want peace. I want lightness in my body and my mind. I want to be safe. I don't want accident. And if I know I want these things, my practice of mindfulness can, can help me. Because we know that uh, the practice of mindfulness can bring peace, can bring peace into ourselves, can bring lightness in our, to our body and our mind. The practice of mindfulness can protect us from accidents. When you drive mindfully, you protect yourself. And many accidents, they don't come like that. But we invite them to come because we, we allow ourselves to be caught by grieving, by anger, by despair. And we draw that accident to ourselves. That is why accidents very often come from ourselves, not from the outside. So may I be peaceful and light in my body and my mind. May I be safe and free from accidents. May, may I be free from anger. When I am angry, I am not happy. So that's what I want. Free from anger, freedom from anger. And the practice will help me to be free from anger. When anger takes hold of me, I feel burned. And that is why I want to be free from anger. I want to be free from unwholesome states of mind. Because anger is an unwholesome state of mind. But beside anger, there is also despair and jealousy. And so on. Fear, worries. May I know how to look at myself with the eyes of understanding and love. Sometimes I cannot accept myself. I hate myself. I am angry at myself. I am not satisfied with myself. Because I don't have eyes of compassion in order to look at myself. If you want to look at another person with compassion, with love, you should, first of all, be able to look at yourself with compassion and accept yourself as you are. And this is the recommendation of the Buddha. May I know how to look at myself with the eyes of understanding and love. If I suffer like that, there must be reasons, there must be conditions. I don't blame myself. If I know how to look uh, deeply at the roots of my suffering, and then I will be able to accept myself, and I will have compassion toward myself. And when you are able to accept yourself, you suffer less right away. There are those of us who can accept other people, but cannot accept ourselves. And that is why we have to practice according to the recommendation made by the Buddha. May I know how to look at myself with the eyes of understanding and compassion. I am learning to love myself to take care of myself. I need understanding. I need compassion. And with the practice, I can afford to offer myself understanding and compassion. May I be able to recognize and touch the seeds of joy and happiness in myself. There are seeds of happiness and joy in me. From time to time, the seeds of happiness and joy in me are water. 
and then bring me the energy of joy and happiness. <coughs> I recognize the existence of these seeds in me. So I am encouraged. And with the practice of mindfulness, later on I will know how to touch, how to water the seed of happiness and joy in me. That's to love myself. You are my friend. You can help touch and water the seed of happiness and joy in me. But I can do that by myself also. I recognize them. And I know how to breathe, how to walk, how to recognize the seed of, of joy and happiness in me in order for them to manifest in me. May I learn how to nourish myself with joy each day. I need joy. I need uh, happiness. May I be able to live uh, fresh, solid and free. I want to be solid. I know that solidity is the base for happiness, the ground of happiness. If I am too unstable, too fragile, and then happiness will not be possible. So I want to cultivate solidity, freshness, and freedom. I have uh, the practice of uh, flower fresh, mountain solid, water reflecting, space free in order to cultivate, help cultivate my solidity, freedom, and calm. May I not fall into the state of indifference. Indifference. You don't care. You are indifferent. I don't want to be that, like that. I want to be concerned for my well-being and for your being. I don't want to be indifferent. I don't want to be caught in the extremes of attachment and aversion. When you are caught by something, you suffer. And when you, you are angry of something, you suffer also. So both attachment and aversion rob me of my freedom, of my happiness. So this is what I want for myself. And the Buddha already taught me, if I want these things, I can offer my, myself these kind of things. So dear friends, you will be, you will be offer a sheet of paper, and you have uh, the English and the Vietnamese here. And uh, you may have a French uh, translation later on. And this is a uh, Meditation for the first uh, phase of uh, love meditation. May I be peaceful and light in my body and in my mind. May I be safe and free from accidents. May I be free from anger and wholesome states of mind, fear and worries. May I know how to look at myself with the eyes of understanding and compassion. May I be able to recognize and touch the seeds of joy and happiness in myself. May I learn how to nourish myself with joy each day. May I be able to live fresh, solid, and free. May I not fall in a state of indifference or be caught in the extremes of attachment and aversion. The first day of the practice, we may just focus on ourselves. We want to offer love to ourselves. Remember, the Buddha always reminds us that the practice of love should be directed to oneself first. And then the second day, we practice for the other person. May he or she be peaceful and light in his or her body and mind. Because you have that already. So now, sitting like this, 
you are offering that to him or to her. May he be peaceful and light in his body or in mind. May she be peaceful and light in her body and mind, in her mind. May she be safe and free from accidents. May she be free from anger, unwholesome state of mind, like fear and worries. May she know how to look at herself with the eyes of understanding and love. And I may help. So that is uh, the second day of the practice. Love directed to another person. And on the third day, we address our love to everyone, not just he or she. Because uh, love is uh, without frontier, unlimited mind. After having success, having been successful in offering ourselves love and the other person love, now we want to share that with all beings. May all beings be peaceful and light in their body and mind. May all beings be safe and free from accidents. That's the way the Buddha taught us to practice, beginning with yourself and with your beloved one, and then with everyone. And on the other side of the sheet of paper, the three days of practice. And uh, we can use the first three days of the year in order to do this practice of love, beginning and new. The first day, I want to reconcile with myself. The world needs reconciliation. But I want to do as the Buddha taught. I want, first of all, to reconcile with myself. Because I'm not at peace with myself. Or I am not entirely at peace with myself. So I should uh, reconcile with myself. That is the first day. I practice looking deeply in order to see the wholesome mental activities that are more latent than manifesting and uh, to find ways to help them to be more manifested. I know I have the seed of love, understanding, forgiveness, and joy. But I don't practice enough. That is why this wonderful seeds have not been watered at all. So I want to sit down and look at myself. I do have these uh, wholesome seeds. I have uh, the seeds of uh, mental formations that can bring me joy and uh, happiness. And then the second thing is uh, looking deeply to see the mental formations, the wholesome mental formations that uh, have manifested, like uh, the feeling of joy, of happiness, of, uh, of uh, reconciliation, of uh, forgiveness of uh, non-discrimination. If they have uh, manifested from time to time, I want them to manifest more. And with the practice of mindfulness, I can help them to manifest more often. Those who have not manifested, I water them. I help them to manifest. Those who have already manifested, I want to keep them and encourage them to stay. Third is uh, looking at the unwholesome mental formations like fear, anger, despair, who stay down there in the bottom of my consciousness. They have not manifested the seat of craving, the seat of violence, the seat of despair. I know they are there, 
in the depth of my consciousness. I don't want them to manifest. I want them to stay there quietly and to become weaker and weaker and weaker every day. Because I know that if once they have the chance to manifest, they become stronger. So I want them to sleep quietly down there. And I have, and I have the practice that can help them to sleep down there. I try to avoid the watering of these seeds. I don't watch television or, or read uh, magazines, articles that can water the seed of violence and fear and anger and despair in me. I practice mindfulness so that I will not water these unwholesome seeds in me and keep them sleeping down there. Because I know if they manifest, I will suffer. That's the third practice. And the fourth practice is that if by any chance some of them have manifested, like despair, like anger, I have to do something in order to help them to go back to their original uh, place. I pay attention to positive things and I encourage these negative things to go back to the depth of my consciousness. It's like uh, when I listen to a CD with uh, the music I don't like, I push on the stop button and I replace the, the CD. So this is the same practice. When a mental formation that is not wholesome manifests, like fear, anger, despair, I don't want them to play, to continue to play. I want to push on the button, stop. Because I know that I have better CDs in me. The good, the wholesome things. So this is the Buddha's uh, teaching on uh, diligence, right diligence. Uh, the good things that have not manifested, give them the chance to manifest. The good things that uh, have manifested, keep them and encourage them to continue manifest. The bad things that are sleeping down there, that are sleeping down there, allow them to, to, to sleep down there. Don't encourage them to come up. Don't water. Don't consume the things that water uh, these seeds. And if it happens that some of them have manifested like fear, anger, despair. We have to try to change the city, to try to help them to go back to their original place and help bring the, the positive things in. Make a note of them, always remembering that the wholesome must be greater than in number than the unwholesome. And you show your practice to a Dharma brother or sister. This is the way uh, I practice in order to take care of the seeds in me. My dear brother, my dear sister, please witness. So you write down these four practices and you report that practice to a Dharma brother or a Dharma sister your partner, a member of your family. And after, after that, you can uh, do some guided meditation on loving kindness. And the text for the meditation on loving kindness is already there. Uh, you can use it. And the first day, Loving kindness should be directed to oneself. And then after, after the practice of uh, guided meditation, because uh, what we begin with is uh, guided meditation on loving kindness. We finish with the five uh, touch, touching the earth. We touch the earth five times. First of all, we touch the earth in order to 
get in touch with our blood ancestors, our the ancestors uh, and our spiritual ancestors. If we are a Christian and then we get in touch with Jesus Christ and other saints, if you are a Buddhist, and then we can touch, uh, get in touch with the Buddha, with the patriarchs, with other teachers. And then the, we touch the spirit of the land where we live. And we, touch, uh, we get in touch with the people who have, uh, uh, we have built this country for us to live. We feel grateful to them. And then uh, we, touch the, we touch the earth in order to get in touch with the people we love. We feel grateful. And then we touch uh, the ground in order to, to, to get in touch and uh, forgive the people who have uh, wronged us, have made us suffer. So uh, today before the, um, the year end, uh, we have uh, a session of uh, practice of uh, touching the earth. And, and we, we will do that together. Sister Chen Kong, two emptiness, will guide us in practicing touching the earth, five uh, touches. And that's uh, the f- f- for the first day. It has three uh, parts. First of all, recognize the good seeds and the, the bad seeds and try to handle them with intelligence. The second is to share uh, to do guided meditation on love according to the text uh, that is offered to you. And third is uh, to practice touching the earth. And uh, that first, first day is uh, the practice of loving kindness directed to oneself. The second day we practice in order to reconcile with uh, our beloved ones. The first thing we do is uh, we determine to write a letter or make uh, a telephone call to our beloved one in mindfulness. We have to prepare before making the phone call. We have to prepare before writing the letter. If we have to practice looking deeply into him or to her in order to see the roots of happiness and suffering in him or in her, in order to be able to write or make the telephone call in a beneficial way. (coughs) We have to meditate first before writing the email or before making the telephone call. And uh, looking deeply also to see how I can help my beloved one in a year ahead. This year I have, I have not helped her as much as I would like, would like to do. But I am determined that next year I will do better. So first of all, we think, uh, we think of writing a letter. We meditate on writing a letter or making a telephone call. And we have to prepare ourselves before we call or we write. Second, we look deeply in order to find out ways to help our beloved one in the year ahead. We have to make a resolution. We shall refrain from doing that, doing that, saying that, saying that. 
yeah, determined to do that for him, for her, to say that for him, for her a lot. Like um, practice the fifth mantra, <laughs> darling. Do you think this is a, a moment of happiness? And we should be able to ask him or her this question. Do I have a habit energy that makes you unhappy, my beloved one? Every one of us has a bad habit energy. And we repeat every time that habit energy comes, we say things, we do things that make our beloved one unhappy. Maybe we have not recognized that habit energy, so we are determined to ask him or her, darling, do I have a habit energy that makes you unhappy from time to time? Please tell me, so that I'll be careful. Tell me, so that in 2010, I will do better. And then uh, the next is uh, do the guided meditation, addressing loving kindness to him or to her. May he be peaceful and light in his body and mind. Instead of saying, may I be happy, you say, may she be happy. May she be peaceful and light in her body and mind. May she be free from accidents. Uh, the, the text is, is there. And then the, we finish the second day of practice with uh, the second session of practice with uh, guided meditation, uh, with um, touching the earth. The same. Uh, touching the earth. And when we touch the earth like that, we release a lot of negative things and we get the nourishment. The third day of uh, practice, loving kindness will be addressed to the person who has caused me suffering. And the first uh, thing we do is to look deeply in order to be able to see the positive, the wholesome thing in him or in her. Because when we are angry at some person, some people, we tend to ignore the positive things in him or her. So when you are angry at someone, the first thing New practice is to look, to recognize the positive things in, her, in him or in her. Find at least five qualities in him and her and write it down. <coughs> and uh, that may be a person, that one who makes you suffer, that may be a person, that may be an establishment a church or a government. If you are angry at them, try the same thing. They have done some bad things, but maybe they have done some good things too. So try to find out five good things. And then you try to look deeply to see what are the unfortunate circumstances which can make that person or that institution what they are. Why such a government is doing like that? Why such a person has been saying things and doing things like that? There must be a root, there must be a reason. We look deeply to see the reason why that person or that institution has behaved like that. why he has a promise to stop the war and he still continue with the war. 
how he uh, she uh, uh, still uh, get angry easily like that. There should be a reason. So this is the practice of looking deeply to see the roots of the suffering in the other person. And when you see the roots, you are released. You have compassion. You don't, uh, you don't condemn him or her anymore. You don't get angry. The next step is to look deeply in order to see how I am able to help that person or that institution in the year 2010. You don't want to destroy him or her. You want to help him or her. And that is compassion. That is loving kindness. And there are ways in order to do so. And then the next thing is uh, to do the, the guided meditation on the other side of the sheet. May he be peaceful and light in his body and mind. Like me. Like I am able to do. The first day I addressed loving kindness to myself. The second day I addressed loving kindness to my beloved. The third day I addressed loving kindness to the person I used to consider as an enemy. I want to love it because that is the love of the, of the Buddha. The love of the Buddha should encompass everyone. And if I am able to love myself and to love my, my beloved one, I'll be able to love them also, the ones who have made me suffer. And after the guided meditation, or of loving kindness addressed to him or to her or to the institution that have made you suffer, you end with the five uh, touching the earth. And this is a, a very complete uh, uh, recommendation of practice. I hope uh, because um, we have the Vietnamese the English. I hope some uh, a brother or sister will translate into French uh, today or tomorrow, so that everyone can has can have uh, a text in order to practice. Dear friends, co practitioners, brothers and sisters, sangha members. The practice of mindfulness can, can be done in two levels. The level of time and the level of uh, timelessness. And these two levels can touch each other. When you generate mindfulness in order to recognize something that is there, like a flower, like a person. You can get in touch with that flower or that person (coughs) in the frame of time and space. And that is uh, to get in touch with the historical dimension. Because uh, on that dimension, every, everything, everyone has a beginning and has an end. A flower has her beginning and her end. A human being also has uh, his uh, beginning and his end. And that is uh, the way we practice uh, 
loving kindness as uh, prescribed by the Buddha. Myself is the object of uh, loving kindness. I am situated in time and space. And my beloved one, she is also located in space and time. I address my loving kindness to her, to him. And that one who make me suffer, I also address my loving kindness to him or to her. But there is another dimension of practice, a layer of practice that, uh, that can be considered to be deeper. When you get in touch with the flower, you can get in touch deeply enough in order to to touch her ultimate dimension. When you get in touch with a person, your mindfulness and concentration and insight, if uh, they have become very deep, you touch also the ultimate dimension of that person. You touch the nature of no birth and no death of that person. You touch the nature of no birth and no death of that flower. It is like uh, when you contemplate a wave on the surface of the ocean. A wave is supposed to have a beginning and end. A wave is supposed to have the coming up and the going down. And you can get in touch with the wave. But if we can get in touch with the wave deeply enough, we can get in touch with the water, which is uh, at the foundation of the wave. In terms of wave, there is a beginning, there is a ending, there is a coming up, there is a going down. But as far as water is concerned, there is no beginning, no end, no going up, going, going down. And we know very well that if, uh, if uh, a wave is uh, capable of uh, touching herself deeply, she recognizes that she is water. And she, with the insight that I am water, the wave is not afraid anymore. She smiles coming up, she smiles coming down. She is not afraid of being and non-being. And this is possible with the Buddhist practice. With mindfulness and concentration, you can get the insight and you can touch your true nature of no birth and no death. And you transcend time and space. And when you are able to transcend time and space, you have no fear, no, no longer any fear. And you are described as someone who is free of time. Akapa, akampa. Kanpa neti. You get out of the time. You enter into timelessness. Vượt thoát thời gian, đi vào kiếp ngoài. And that is the ultimate aim of the practice. If you practice uh, deeply enough, you get out of time. You enter timelessness. And that is possible with the practice of uh, great insight. We know that uh, the notion of uh, week, years, the beginning of the year, the new year, the old year, all these are invented by the human mind. Let us let us imagine the new year is flying from the east to the west. Now, it's almost 10 o'clock in Bangkok, and there will be two more hours for the new year to come. Uh, but uh, but uh, in France, 
they need uh, more time to come. So the new year is flying. The time is uh, traveling in space. And that is entirely the human creation. The notion of time and space. A creation of our mind. And that is why it is possible to free ourselves from the notion of time and space as the two distinctive uh, entities. Modern science speaks already of uh, non-locality. And uh, they give the hint that if we look deeply enough, we'll be able to transcend the notion of time and space. And this is uh, the deepest practice within Buddhism. If uh, you are very mindful and concentrated, you can get the kind of insight that brings you out of time and space. And for you to touch timelessness. We shall gather again here uh, in the meditation hall for sitting meditation. I welcome in the new year. But before that, uh, we shall have an opportunity to have um, a, a practice of uh, touching the earth. And before that, uh, share a happy meal. Remember, we have more than enough conditions to be happy in the here and the now. This moment is a wonderful moment. Enjoy the few hours that are left for 2009, and we will welcome the new year together. <coughs> As our friends uh, in uh, Thailand, whether they have uh, received uh, the Dharma talk well, One hour and 14 minutes.